Yes, I made a mistake. But, I had a bookmarker in here on what I was most concerned about. I thought AMA was to blame for all of this, but this showed me they're not. In chapter 10, Transformation, there's a little bit in here under uncontrollable costs. Listen to this. The massive growth of the biotechnology, medical device, and pharmaceutical industries, along with the vast sums of money spent by federal and state governments on health care, transformed American medicine. It changed from a collection of disparate practices run by individual doctors with few or no employees into a conglomeration of hospitals, medical schools, physicians' offices, corporate enterprises, and ancillary medical agencies. Medicine became profit-driven and inadequately or incoherently regulated. And this new breed of American medicine constituted the largest business component of the nation's economy. While trillions of dollars in revenues fill the corporate coffers of the medical industrial complex, the problems of escalating costs that had first appeared in the late 60s began to plague American medicine again. One issue was that the innovative and costly medical and surgical treatments were fueling medicine's expansion. Prior to World War II, clinical advances did not significantly increase health care costs. The once simplistic patient-comes-first medical decision had evolved into an often complex situation involving reimbursement issues, length of stay, out-of-pocket costs, and monetary restrictions on care. Big medicine meant inefficiencies, overuse of services, overemphasis on technology, and fragmentation of clinical care. At the same time, the freer flow of funds into medicine also increased physicians' incomes. Higher incomes exaggerated financial expectations. As these problems worsened throughout the 1970s, organized medicine, which might have been able to curtail this spending spiral, grew increasingly weak. Partly, the AMA had lost influence due to political miscalculations and the fracturing influence of specialism. And starting in the late 1970s, a series of judicial decisions removed whatever teeth organized medicine had left. Courts ruled that the AMA and state medical societies could not compel hospital appointments due to be contingent on membership in their groups. These decisions also prevented the AMA and its affiliates from punishing physicians who advertised their services. Most conspicuously, the Supreme Court ruled that medical societies were not exempt from antitrust regulations, thereby restricting the ability of medical organizations to coordinate lobbying and work stoppage activities among their members. Stripped of much of its authority, the AMA watched its membership dwindle. It is now made up of less than one in five American physicians. In effect, the AMA no longer speaks for a unified medical profession, and an emboldened organized medicine as it once existed does not survive. With the remnants of organized medicine unable to control health care expenditures, the federal government began to enact a series of legislative reforms during the 1980s and 1990s, designed to contain the cost increase. The government wanted to control hospital markups and created a program that arranged diagnosis into hundreds of diagnosis-related groups, or DRGs. Hospitals would receive a preset reimbursement for each admission based on a specific DRG instead of actual money spent. DRGs were part of the government's attempt to become a more vigilant purchaser of hospital services using so-called prospective payment plans. 
the federal government also instituted a convoluted methodology known as the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, or RBRVS, that determined how much money physicians should be paid through Medicare and Medicaid. This system calculated doctor's fees using resource costs instead of what a physician deemed his charge should be. Resource costs are based on three components, physician's work, practice expense, and medical malpractice premiums. The complex RBRVS tabulates physician payments by multiplying the combined component cost of a service with a conversion factor that Medicare changes annually. Payments are also adjusted by geographic region to a service performed in Manhattan is worth more than one completed in Omaha, for example. At the same time the government instituted these reforms, it started a move toward managed care for those with private health insurance. The intent of fostering managed care was to reduce the cost of providing health benefits and improve the quality of patient care through a variety of mechanisms, including economic incentives for physicians and patients to select less costly forms of testing and treatment, programs for reviewing the medical necessity of specific services, and controls on hospital administrations and lengths of stay. Critics suggest it did little besides create an alphabet soup of health care delivery networks, including health maintenance organization, HMOs, preferred provider organizations, PPOs, in independent practice associations, IPAs, and the point of service plans, POS. Managed care and its offshoot are now nearly ubiqu ubiquitous in the United States, but they have failed, as did DRGs and the RBRVS and a host of other reform measures to control medical costs. Despite the government's efforts, the rise of for-profit corporate guided medicine has created an economic tyranny of medical services and scientific technology. The underlying principle that more money expended is better continues to guide the nation's health care system. For procedures like angioplasty, stenting, and laroscopic hernia repair, the current health care delivery system rewards physicians and hospitals for how much they provide rather than the, how cost effective or clinically valuable it is. The result is that total spending on physicians, hospitals, drugs, tests, and the like is so sizable that it now consumes nearly a fifth of the country's economy and its continued in increase threatens America's overall financial stability. Health care will cost the country $2.5 trillion in 2010 and the financial situation will probably worsen with the medical demands of an aging bo baby boomer generation and the added possibility that tens of millions of uninsured individuals may gain coverage under any new public insurance plan. <clears throat> well, I could see where he is against uh, health insurance for us poor. But the only thing about it that I don't like is that somebody might force you to pay monies in for this, even when you're very poor and cannot find a doctor who will take you, which you can't could barely find one here in Oklahoma City if you have Medicare and Medicaid even if you got Medicaid too and they give very little of that here in the states now and now the Republicans are support supporting one of the hospitals down here on the south side that charges like 10 15 times the amount any other hospital you have to go to in an ambulance it's outrageous it's crazy and it sounds very corrupt. And we'll see how much it goes. He's got a lot of details in this book that are very important and things to think about. Because it's time to see who's responsible for all this corruption in our health care uh, field. And I'm beginning to s suspect that a lot of it is financial investment companies, predator lawyers, and insurance companies so we'll see I had so many questions about AMA but 
Now I'm going to turn around and ask him, ask these questions of people I suspect are responsible for tearing our health care down as well as our country. Well, y'all have a good night. Stay cool. It's hot out there.